This is the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. I'm Stephen A. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airways of ESPN Radio. That's 710 ESPN LA. That's 98.7 FM, New York City. And, of course, nationwide over the airways of Sirius XM, Channel 80. Number to call up, as always, is 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Got a jammed, packed show coming your way today. Is the one and only Nick Saban in the house? Is the great Nick Saban in the house, the greatest coach in the history of college football, as far as I'm concerned? Is that man going to be in the house? Man, that's won national championships at two different schools. That dude. Can't wait to talk to the great Nick Saban. Roll Tide. He'll be in the house approximately 15 minutes after hour number two. Looking forward to that conversation. Of course, we'll get into the latest NFL findings, CTE in the NFL. Apparently, the American Medical Association found evidence of brain disease in 99% of the 202 former football players that they studied from athletics from athletes in the NFL down to high school. We'll talk about what kind of impact, if any at all, should this have on not only present-day NFL players, but aspiring NFL players. We'll definitely discuss that as the show progresses today. Conor McGregor and Floyd Money Mayweather, not only are they coming to the arena in Las Vegas, but evidently a theater near you. We'll be talking about that as well. And, of course, the Dallas Cowboys always find a way to make news, always find a way to be relevant, always find a way to be relevant in the news for the most inexplicable reasons imaginable because they are who they are. No, some way, somehow, when it counts, they will let you down. So the Cowboys I'm talking about. I'll explain the latest reason as to why that is. As the show progresses today, first order of business, however, is LeBron James and Kyrie Irving still yet again. And the story that resonates in my mind, I have to confess to you, is a couple of things. First, I want to say this. If you're the city of Los Angeles, how do you feel about the fact that CP3 has departed? And in return, you got Patrick Beverly and a couple of other pieces. Now, I love Patrick Beverly. He can play on my team any day of the week. But when you think CP3, don't you find yourself thinking that the Clippers should have made more concerted effort to get their hands on Kyrie since Chris Paul was approaching free agency and the likelihood and the possibility was that he was going to want out of L.A.? I kind of think that's something that people should have been thinking about and talking about. That's just me. That's just me. That's how I feel about that. And on the flip side, the other side of the country, I'm looking at New York City, and I'm thinking that Steve Mills and Mr. Perry, Scott Perry, they've got to find some way to get their hands on Kyrie Irving. Because if I'm going to lose a Carmelo Anthony, I want it to be for a Kyrie. And I got to admit to you, I'm a little bit biased because I'm a native New Yorker. And even though I'm from Hollis, Queens, I got plenty of friends from the Mitchell Projects in the Bronx. We're Dred, Dredrick. Irvin, the father of Kyrie Irving, was raised. And I got to tell you, the more I think about Kyrie in a New York Knicks uniform, the more I think about Kyrie Irving invading Madison Square Garden, the more I think about Knicks fans having that kind of showtime brother with those ball handling skills, with his closest mentality, with his zest and hunger to prove that he is indeed franchise player material. The more I'm salivating at the thought of that man being in a New York Knicks uniform. I got to admit it. I got to admit it. 866-729-ESPN is always the number to call up. That's 866-729-3776. As an aside, revisiting the whole brouhaha involving myself and LeBron James, it's very, very simple, y'all. He's the greatest player in the world. I have no reason to believe that he's, 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 he's anything less than a great person. Great father, great husband, great family man, great iconic figure, very charitable and philanthropic in his nature with the things that he's done 
the thousands of kids he puts through school, et cetera, et cetera. My disagreement with LeBron James is over this particular incident, how in a quest to control the narrative, he tried to throw me under the bus. I ain't appreciate that. But this notion that somehow, some way I threatened him, I got to admit to y'all, listen, you know, we talk black and white all the time. And this is one of those situations, man, where I just respectfully disagree with people out there who labeled it as a threat. If you heard me speak yesterday about it, I said we could get into what happened in 2010 and why you really left for South Beach, but we won't go there. That's not a threat. I mean, oh, my God, Stephen, that that sounded like a threat. I mean, Stephen, you see Dan Levitard over his radio show. Oh, it's a threat. I mean, whatever, what other journalist have you ever heard? Well, Dan Levitard ain't like most journalists. Doesn't stop him from being great. And neither am I. It doesn't stop me from being great. Ladies and gentlemen, I was a beat writer in Philadelphia for the Philadelphia Inquirer, covering Allen Iverson for the first 10 years of his career. Do y'all know that this was the star? Was there a bigger star in his prime other than Michael Jordan than Allen Iverson in the modern-day era? Would it just say, no, no, John, there wasn't, didn't get much bigger? I covered the team he was the franchise player for. I was the beat writer for the number one paper in town. Do you know that Allen Iverson and I went eight months without talking to each other? Because he was ticked with me, and I was ticked at him for being ticked at me. I thought he was wrong. I knew he was wrong. I thought he was pretty damn petty. So what? And you know what I used to say? If you remember back then, John, if you remember back then, Nuno, what did I used to say? Hell, I didn't say what I could have said. Does anybody doubt that now? It's not a threat because I won't do it. I would never do that. I'm simply reminding the person, you don't have any reason to have an attitude. Because there's always more that could be said, not just by me, but by anybody who covers this league. But I would never do that. And not just to a player. I wouldn't do it to a coach. I wouldn't do it to an assistant coach. I wouldn't do it to a scout. I wouldn't do it to an executive. I wouldn't do it to an owner. Because contrary to the tenets of our profession and what it tries to disseminate, I don't happen to believe that every little detail of people's lives are our business. I've seen plenty of things that I don't approve of that I don't co-sign, that I personally wouldn't do, just like I've seen people get into things that I would have gotten into or do things that I would have done, and I'll turn the other way. Ain't none of my business. If I cover basketball, I'm trying to talk basketball. If I cover football, I'm trying to cover, I'm trying to talk football. Nobody threatened LeBron James. I was pointing out an obvious fact. Bro, there's always more that could be said fall back hell you get an attitude for and if you got attitude keep it with Kyrie not with the media chronicling what's going on if he didn't ask to be traded who would have been talking about LeBron James you just lost in the finals that's five on your resume one could argue it should be seven that the only legitimate title you should have had was the first one against Oklahoma City. Ray Allen came to the rescue in game six against the Spurs. And when you came back from three to one last year, don't get me started with how the league sit up there and sabotaged everything with that bogus suspension against Draymond Green for game five. You know where I stand. LeBron James could easily be one and seven in the NBA Finals. Am I lying, Nuno? Am I lying, John? He could easily be one and seven in the NBA Finals. Focus on basketball. Focus on your teammates. Stop worrying about the media. While swearing, you don't care what the media has to say. That's all. Nothing more. Kevin Durant was different. Kevin Durant called me a liar. That was very personal. Want to say that was a threat? Got to own that. Because I did say, you don't want to make an enemy out of me. That's true. That could be interpreted that way. I did not threaten LeBron James. And I was wrong to say that about Kevin Durant. I still say he owes me an apology 
One I will never get, of course, because I never did anything. But say, the man is thinking about leaving OKC. I'm here in L.A. at the time, but it could change. But he's thinking about leaving OKC. That's all I said. Didn't warrant his diatribe. Still owes me an apology for it. But for me to tell him, you don't want to make an enemy out of me, I was wrong. I should not have used those words. I didn't threaten LeBron. Not at all, because I would never say anything out of, out of pocket, out of turn. It's none of my business. But he needs to focus on Kyrie and why players are siding with Kyrie in terms of him not wanting to play with LeBron anymore. That's what he needs to be thinking about. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. I want you to think about the Clippers. Why they didn't get Kyrie? How come they didn't use CP3 to get Kyrie? I want you to tell me why you don't think the Lakers should even be thinking about having him. And I agree with it. But then again, maybe not. And why the Knicks need to do everything they can to get their hands on Kyrie. I'm telling you that right now. Plus, I'll get into the Cowboys and so much more up next. This is Stephen A. Smith. By the way, when it comes to our cars, one thing is almost certain. Something at some time is going to break down, and if your vehicle warranty is expired, one big repair can break your bank. There are auto protection plans out there, of course, but one only one stands alone, and that's TOCO Warranty. With TOCO, you don't pay upfront fees for service you may never use. TOCO makes protecting your car easy with their pay-as-you-go plan. Just pay a small amount each month and keep the protection for as long as you like. With TOCO, there is no long-term contract, no upfront fees, and you can cancel at any time. So do me a favor, please. Get peace of mind. Knowing you are protected with coverage plans on the engine, electrical, transmission, cooling system, drive axle, and more. Please enjoy the benefits of roadside assistance and paid rental car fees. Toco Special Concierge Service guides you through the entire process from sales to claims to customer service, all under one roof. So don't risk being grounded by auto repairs you can't afford. See if you qualify for Toco at 800-211-2884. That's 800-211-2884. That's 800-211-2884. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show with your boy Stephen A. in the house right here on ESPN Radio. Don't touch that dial. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Stephen A. Smith Show. Back here at you. ESPN Radio. Sirius XM style. Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. keeping my eyes on some of the things that's going on in the world of sports. Um, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something right now. I'm starting. I'm not there yet officially, but I'm starting to believe these Los Angeles Dodgers could possibly win it all. I- I'm starting to believe that, y'all. I-, I mean, listen, the Cubs are back in the mix because originally the beginning of the s- season, I picked the Cubs to repeat. Y'all remember that new note, John, right? I picked the Cubs to repeat. But, I- damn, I can't ignore 70 and 31. I just can't ignore it. I mean, 70 and 31. Dave Roberts doing a hell of a job as the manager for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Now, Kershaw tweaking that back, going on a DL. Not good. Not good. But let me tell you why it is good. Because that means he'll rest that arm. And he won't go into the postseason tired. That's a very, very big deal. Something to think about. I'm starting to believe the Dodgers because I don't believe in the Washington Nationals. I just don't believe in them. I don't care that they're 59 and 39. I don't care that they got Bryce Harper, who I love. I don't care about all of that. I don't care that they're strong in this rotation, even though they're both in the suspect. I, I just, I don't believe in them. I don't believe in them. Dodgers, winners of four straight. Uh, different story. Different story. My Yankees in second place right now. Just a game behind the Boston Red Sox. Seem to be getting it going. Jacoby Ellsbury, not very, very happy with Joe Girardi and the Yankees right now. Going to have to get over it. Young studs that the Yankees have in place of him, you're going to have to deal with that. Even though he's getting $21 million this year. But that's life. As long as you get paid, make your contributions, do what you got to do. As long as it's not politics, because I don't blame him for being furious over that. But if it's not politics, and dudes are just better than you right now, you got to flow with those results. You just do. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Went to the break talking about LeBron and Kyrie. Imagining Kyrie and why he should have been a Los Angeles Clipper. 
and how the Clippers slipped up in not getting that deal done. Guess they was counting on CP3 staying. But Jerry West is there right now. I believe in that man. And the combination of him with Doc Rivers, who I love dearly, uh, who knows what's going to happen with the Clippers. Time will tell. We shall wait and see. To the phones we go. Brandon, you're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Talk to me, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. What's up, Stephen A.? I'm good. Okay, now, when I look at the whole Kyrie thing, you got Steve Nash, you got Isaiah Thomas from the Bad Boys, you got Steph Curry now, you got Allen Iverson. Now, all those guards are 6'3 and under, so I'm having a hard time believing why people couldn't see with some defensive liabilities for all of them come concerning their size. I'm having a hard time seeing why people can't believe Kyrie can't get on the squad. And as great as he is offensively and with the defensive liabilities to a certain extent, still be the guy on that team. Still be the guy on which team? Cleveland? I'm, I'm saying any team he went to. No, I, 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 why do you think that people can't see that about Kyrie? I don't get that impression. I think everybody sees that about Kyrie. We well, know that so we like know that Tom he's Harris not LeBron. Story. We know that he's not LeBron. But at the same time, we can't sit up there and say that, you know, we don't look at Kyrie that way. Kyrie can ball, man. Yeah, most definitely. It's just some people like Tom Haverstrow, you know, he likes to get into the numbers. He was doing some of his hits yesterday. And it seemed like the numbers combined with his eye test, he was believing like, I mean, look, Kyrie can't be the guy. He's 3-14 and 14 with Kevin Love. Um, when LeBron is out 3-14 and 14, when it's just him and Kevin Love playing. So, I mean, I think if he actually had that chance. Well, they, they, don't, they, don't win. they don't win when LeBron James is not on the court. But at the same time, that's just a few games. That's not what a season made. What we have, the ultimate indictment against Kyrie is what he was before LeBron arrived. But that's when he was 21 years old. He's 25 now. And so when you look at it from that perspective, he's 25. He's been to three consecutive NBA finals. He's won a championship. He's hit a game winner to deliver the championship. And on top of all of that, he's averaged better than 27 when healthy in the finals against Steph Curry and the crew, Klay Thompson and the crew, to be more exact. I got to give credit where credit is due in regards to that and Kyrie. At 6-1 or so, 6-2, you don't want him to be that franchise guy per se, but it clearly there's nothing about his talent that says he can't pull it off. It's just that LeBron James is a physical freak of nature, just like Kevin Durant is a physical freak of nature. And even though Steph Curry is not a physical freak of nature, the fact that he can pull up from 40 makes him a freak of nature. And that's where it gets interesting. Yeah, you're definitely right about that. Uh, I got one more. I got Hurry one up. Go ahead. Before. Go ahead, bro. Hurry well, up. What, you, what my Panthers looking like? What you got for them this year? Your pa- Carolina Panthers? Yes, sir. You know what? I expect them to make a return. I don't think they're going to be as bad as they were last year. I'm happy that Gettleman is gone. I hope he can feed his family and he's not going broke. I don't wish that on anybody, but I'm glad he's not the general manager for the Carolina Panthers any longer because I think that he cultivated bad relationships. And because he did that, if that were a player, we'd be saying we got to get them out of that locker room. So if that's the case with a player, how come it can't be the case with the general manager? It was right for Gettleman to be gone. He should have never let go of Josh Norman without having a backup plan. Uh, But having said all of that, I think Ron Rivera, who I just saw about a week ago in the Carolina Panthers, are going to recognize the error of their ways, and I think they'll be okay. And as a result, defensively, they will be a lot better, particularly in the secondary than they were. Offensively, Christian McCaffrey, I'm a fan. I got to admit to you, Brandon, I think it's reverse discrimination. I think if Christian McCaffrey was black, we would be talking about what an elite running back the Carolina Panthers picked up with the number eight overall pick in the NFL draft. But because he is white and playing the running back position, I don't think he's gotten nearly the love that he deserves. I've said that for months, and I'm going to repeat that till the cows come home. This brother and what he did at Stanford, we should be giving him a hell of a lot more praise out of, based off of what he did in college than we have given him. There's no doubt. Appreciate the call. Mike, you're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, Mike? How you doing, man? I'm good. Talk to me, baby. How you doing? What's up? Hey, man, I'm I'm doing great, man. I'm just loving this LeBron and Kyrie thing. And, man, I (laughs) remind you for one thing, man. Hey, you stick to your guns when you come out with a story or you report what you heard. And, you know what I'm saying, you use the right words. And, once again, you ain't getting nothing wrong. You just reporting what you you, you hear. Well, the thing about it, Mike, it's, it's interesting that you say that because my whole point is this. I could see if I sat up there and I said definitively for a fact this is what happened and I wasn't there. 
What I said was, this is what was told to me. This is what they called and said. This is what the other side called and said. Last night, I'm on the phone, literally, with peeps from the Mitchell Projects in the Bronx that grew up with Kyrie's father, that still know him and the Irvin family, who were talking about what the hell is going on and why this guy feels the way that he feels. Once I do that, I've done my job. What's the problem? Exactly. You know what the problem is? Like you said, LeBron ain't never trying to stand up. He ain't never trying to own nothing that he get that he get caught for. He's been doing that for years. And it's just all coming out. Kyrie the first guy to stand up, you know what I'm saying, to him and say what he had to say. You'll never you know, you don't never hear that about too many other sports. Well it's you know? interesting that you but, say that too, because he is getting hit now and he wanted to change that negative narrative. And LeBron may deserve for that to happen because in reality, at the end of the day, LeBron is not actually wrong in any of this. There's nothing right. definitive that he's done to Kyrie Irving, which is why I don't understand why he had to get caught up in his feelings and be all ultra sensitive about stuff. He's home on vacation. You lost the finals, but you didn't do anything wrong to Kyrie. Kyrie just believes in himself more than most people do. And he's like, I'm a franchise player too, and I'm tired of playing second fiddle to King James. I don't see where either side is wrong. I really don't. Right. Neither side ain't wrong. and I don't understand why people on Kyrie here. Hey, man, the man the man say he want to move on. Let him move on, man. The man deserved that. He, he, he's that good, man. He's, he has shown what he can do. And like you say, he's been the three finals in a row. Man, ain't nothing else for the man to do. He got all the confidence in the world now. He's going to hit every big shot now, he, now, he come, now, his, come his way. Now check this you know out. I mean? now, now check this out. The New York Post. Stephen A. Smith goes scorch earth on LeBron with threats of a real story. How is it a threat when all I said was I could get into what you what what you why you really left in 2010, but we're not going there. Right. How is that a threat? I mean, I, I got to admit, man. I mean, it, 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 do we have to have a conversation? I, I know, listen, I'm not speaking of bonics, but clearly there's right. a difference between how black folks interpret threats and how white folks deter- interpret threats. Because I don't get this. I don't understand how that was a threat. I really don't. I really hey, don't. You, you know, you know what it is, man. It, it, it's just it's coming from you. So you know <laughs> when it comes from you. It's, you know, all ears, all ears listening, all eyes looking. We're looking, man. Do your thing, man. No I love you, man. Same you know, here. We love, love is always here, do, bro. You know that. I'll talk to you later. Appreciate you, Mike. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. I'll continue talking about Kyrie, LeBron, New York, and L.A. markets, and which one would be better for Kyrie. Plus, I'll get into the Dallas Cowboys, specifically Coach Jason Garrett, and why he has basically validated yet again why the Dallas Cowboys are nothing more than an accident waiting to happen. I'll explain that and then some in a minute. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Back to the phones we go right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. ESPN Radio, 866-729-ESPN is the number to call up. That's 866-729-3776. I saw my man LeVar Ball on the air a little while ago. Um, <clears throat> look, I got news for y'all, ladies and gentlemen. LaVar Ball got on a lot of our nerves. He had me worried about his son because of the pressure he was applying to his son. And you turn around and look at his son. His son's box office. LaVar Ball has Lonzo Ball box office. You watch the summer leagues because of LeVar Ball. You can't wait for the Lakers season to start because of LeVar Ball. Say what you want, but he handled his business, y'all. He really, really did. Kevin in Pennsylvania, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. How are you? Hey, uh, what's up, Stephen A.? I'm all right. Go ahead, man. I got a question about Kyrie. I'm listening. Do you think do you think he's better than LeBron? Of course not. That's an idiotic question. You know basketball, that's insane. Continue. Bye, man. See, you know, I promised my sisters, especially after my mama passed, that I was gonna try to be nicer to my callers. Could everybody sit up there, oh, Steve, you're a little bit harsh. It's like we got 
time constraints. You know, we got stuff to do. You know, I'm not trying to be rude, but, you know, we got hundreds of callers on the line. It's like, get to it, get to it, get to it. I appreciate the pleasantries and all of that, but I don't need everybody to spread the love or whatever. But you do also have some of the stupidest callers on the planet. They do stuff like this man was on hold just to ask that dumb question. So he could sit up there and say, yeah, watch me get Stephen A to go off for me. See, that's stupid and childish. That's idiotic. That's why from the future, I, I, I'm explaining this to y'all. So in the future, when I just hang up on you and I go to the next caller, you know why. Because I don't tolerate idiocy. Brian in Brooklyn, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Stephen A. Hey, what's up? I'm all right. Go ahead. Very excited to be on your show. Long time listener. Uh, I wanted to call in because I listened to you talk about Kaepernick yesterday, and I was totally against everything you were saying. Like, uh, first off, I don't think he plays well enough. That's really why he don't have a job. And you say a lot of things about white and black. Man, everybody who watches the NFL, they like beer, yelling. If you go to a game, it doesn't matter what color you are. Stop right there. Stop right there. You are talking about 65. Stop, 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 stop. The owner for the New York Giants would emphatically disagree. He is quoted as saying he has never seen the hostility and the venom in letters and email written to his organization over a player to the degree that Colin Kaepernick, the subject of Colin Kaepernick, received. You can say what you want about Americans and their beer drinking cells with the tailgate parties and all that other stuff. What is undeniable is that even drunk, you will find patriots everywhere, meaning individuals who love this country and what the red, white, and blue represents, who took Colin Kaepernick's stance incredibly personally. That is undeniable. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's fair to him. But there is no question that that exists. And for you to call up here, Brian, and act like, oh, people don't care about that. They just care about football. You got your head in the sand. Because there are tens of millions of people who are NFL fans that were damn near violent over it. And that's a fact. Foolish people. Okay. We agree there. But you didn't say yeah. that. You said they don't yeah, exist. Foolish people. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. What, you, hold on. what was your first hold on, wait. what was your first statement? Because now you're saying they're foolish. I don't I just I agree with you there. I agree with you. But that's not what that's you said. It. You said they and don't exist. Gone. Hooray. And then you were saying about how the we they should feel like they should sit down and be quiet. Sixty five percent of them are black, this and that. You started to get racially involved. It's like that's crazy, man. It doesn't matter what color any player hold on, hold on, is. Hold on, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You're talking to my listeners. We have to hear you. Listen to my question. Are you saying it's wrong or that it doesn't exist? That's what I'm asking you. In other words, when you're talking, is the Colin Kaepernick a real issue that you feel is foolish and wrong? Or are you saying that, oh, no, there aren't people out there that's hating on him. It's just that he went one for t- one in ten and he completed less than 60 percent of his passes. And that's why he doesn't have a job. What is your position? It's a combination. And he didn't take a strong he didn't take a strong enough stance for what he believed in because he didn't really have nothing that he that was concrete that he believed in. And I, I mean, so that's the big part of it right there. And then, yeah, he really didn't play that great. But coming off an injury like, like he did, he well, did Brian, play I agree. I, I agree I with mean, you. Hold on, hold on, Brian. Hold on, Brian. Hold on, Brian. I agree with you that he didn't play well. But even before he really, really articulated and got into his stance, there were people who were in an uproar just by mere virtue of the fact that he refused to stand for the national anthem. He didn't have to utter a word other than that. The the second they knew that he would not stand for the national anthem intentionally, there was venom aimed in his direction. Are you denying that? No, no, it totally was. It totally was. But okay. that's just being silly. I mean, you had to know that was going to happen. But wait a minute. That's, but, I mean, but, that's but, that, but that's not, but like, that's not racial. Never, 
that's not racial. Okay. If you if you have black people standing up, reminding you that that's perfectly within his right, and you have no problem with it, and you have an abundance of white Americans who were diametrically opposed to it and actually thought that he should be banned from the NFL because of it, that's not divided along racial lines in terms of perspective. Like I said, Steve, he he can hide behind all these. If you if you go to an NFL game and you disrespect something to do with the American flag and that and those and those in those seats. You're going to get beaten and pummeled. And the only reason he can act like that is because he's behind all these guards. It doesn't matter what color he is. And you know oh, I'm no. right. I, I, but that's, the, my, that's my problem with you. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm saying that's off the subject. Nobody's saying that you're wrong about that. But it's off the subject. It doesn't negate the fact that that's what people felt and that's what people were willing to do. You're just, oh, you know, you're changing the narrative. No, that was the narrative. That's what happened. Well, that's why he don't have a job. But, that, he does, but he doesn't have a job because he took that stance to begin with, period. Right, and he can't take that stance when he's hiding behind them. If he wants but to hide behind stance, who? He can do it on his own. Hiding behind all the guards and the police and the authority and the people that are doing the NFL show for him oh, Lord. to have a place. That's a, different, a place that's a different subject for another day. Have a nice day. Brian is basically talking about he's got security. He's an NFL player. If he were in the stands, he'd get beat up. What's your What's the point of bringing that up? So he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it if he was in the stands because he'd get beat down. That's why you won't hold. Back with more to Stephen A. Smith show in a minute. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of one million dollars. What color is the White House? Um, I know this, I know this, I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay, judges. That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Approximately 25 minutes, we will have arguably the greatest football coach in the history of college football. Arguably, the one and only Nick Saban from Alabama. He will be in the house with yours truly. Can't wait for that. Can't wait for that at all. 866-729-ESPN is the number to call up. That's 866 3776 Back to the phones we go. Let's go to Devin and White Plains. You're live with Stephen A. What's up, Devin? Hey, Stephen. How you doing? I'm good. Talk to me, man. First, first time talking to you, man. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Even though you drive me crazy. That's, but, what, I'm uh, supposed, that's what I'm supposed I'm, to do. That's what I'm supposed I'm to glad, do. I'm glad to, get, I'm glad to get through to you. I got I got two comments. All right, but hurry up, because we, hurry up because we only all got right. a couple of minutes. Go ahead. Okay. First of all, I don't think uh, LeBron can beat Kyrie Irving. That's number one. Beat him so where? Beat here. him where? Where? What do you mean? Beat, beat him in his ASS, like he said he'd be tempted to do if he was in man, front he, of him. He, he didn't mean I, that, man. He was he, just talking. Well, you know how you just talking yeah. junkie. You just upset. He didn't mean that, man. But go ahead. Just because you're the favorite don't mean you got to win. I got you. That's that's number one. Number two, man, don't you think I listened to you uh, on your podcast last night. You know, it was recorded or whatever. Yep. And I'll be on YouTube. Sure. And you was doing a lot of yelling and everything, and you was talking about how this guy didn't call you. He could have picked up the phone and called you and everything. Don't you think you're taking that a little too personal and it's a little bit egotistical on your behalf? No, no, no. Let, like well, let me, let, me res- you? let me respond to that. No, I don't. And let me answer the question as to why that is. I have no problem if you have nothing to say. You don't have to talk to me. But what I'm saying to you is that if you know I'm going to go on the air and comment, if you know I'm going to reach tens of millions of people, don't hide when I'm looking for you and then got something to say when I found a way to get the information. 
don't do that. I mean, this is what I this is this is what I do for a living. I host a radio show. I host a television show. I report. I mean, it ain't some Joe Blow picking up. For, I don't need an interview or anything like that. But I never talk about anybody with trying to reach it without trying to reach out and talk to them. And what I always say to them is, you don't get to use evasiveness and inaccessibility as a tactic to derail me from doing my job. If you have, I owe, I have an obligation professionally to extend a hand to you to let you know you can reach out to me if you want to make sure to put your spin on something. If you don't take advantage of that, that's your problem. That's all I mean by that statement. All right, just 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 in response to what you just said, I think that subliminal stuff is coward stuff. And one thing I give you is you speak your mind and you call out names, and and I appreciate that. Thank you. But I, I just like to advise you that it ain't always good to fall in the subliminal trap because what they're going to do, what cowards do, is when you pick up on the subliminal and you know they're talking about you or to you, when you address them about it and you embarrass them about it, then they're going to say, uh, I wasn't talking to him. I was talking well, you're about right. well, let me, I got. I got hold on, Devin. I mean in hold on, Devin. I, I got to go, and I appreciate your point. But be clear, Devin, that I get what you're saying. You're absolutely right, which is why 99% of the time I don't say anything. But if I'm hosting a television show and I'm hosting a radio show and I'm on the air live airways four hours a day, eventually, you, 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 you know, I'm going to address something particularly when tacitly or otherwise is addressed towards me. So most times I, I, I do exercise exactly, Devin, what you're saying I should exercise. But at the same time, that doesn't mean I'm always going to do it, nor do I always want to do it. Because my obligation and my affinity and affection is to my audience, not to athletes. I cover them. I'm obligated to y'all. Hour number two up next. Nick Saban's coming up too. Don't go anywhere. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Stephen A. Smith Show. Back here at you. ESPN Radio. Sirius XM style. Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Just keeping my eyes on some of the things that's going on in the world of sports. Um, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something right now. I'm starting. I'm not there yet officially, but I'm starting to believe these Los Angeles Dodgers could possibly win it all. I- I'm starting to believe that, y'all. I-, I mean, listen, the Cubs are back in the mix because originally the beginning of the s- season – I picked the Cubs to repeat. Y'all remember that new note, John, right? I picked the Cubs to repeat. But, uh, damn, I can't ignore 70 and 31. I just can't ignore it. I mean, 70 and 31. Dave Roberts doing a hell of a job as the manager for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Now, Kershaw tweaking that back, going on a DL. Not good. Not good. But let me tell you why it is good. Because that means he'll rest that arm. And he won't go into the postseason tired. That's a very, very big deal. Something to think about. I'm starting to believe the Dodgers, because I don't believe in the Washington Nationals. I just don't believe in them. I don't care that they're 59 and 39. I don't care that they got Bryce Harper, who I love. I don't care about all of that. I don't care that they're strong in this rotation, even though they're both in the suspect. I, I just, I don't believe in them. I don't believe in them. Dodgers, winners of four straight. Uh, different story. Different story. My Yankees in second place right now. Just a game behind the Boston Red Sox. Seem to be getting it going. Jacoby Ellsbury not very, very happy with Joe Girardi and the Yankees right now. Going to have to get over it. Young studs that the Yankees have in place of him, you're going to have to deal with that. Even though he's getting $21 million this year. But that's life. As long as you get paid, make your contributions, do what you got to do. As long as it's not politics, because I don't blame him for being furious over that. But if it's not politics and dudes are just better than you right now, you got to flow with those results. You just do. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. Went to the break talking about LeBron and Kyrie. Imagining Kyrie and why he should have been a Los Angeles Clipper 
and how the Clippers slipped up in not getting that deal done. Guess they was counting on CP3 staying. But Jerry West is there right now. I believe in that man. And the combination of him with Doc Rivers, who I love dearly, uh, who knows what's going to happen with the Clippers. Time will tell. We shall wait and see. To the phones we go. Brandon, you're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Talk to me, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. What's up, Stephen A.? Okay, now, when I look at the whole Kyrie thing, you got Steve Nash, you got Isaiah Thomas from the Bad Boys, you got Steph Curry now, you got Allen Iverson. Now, all those guards are 6'3 and under, so I'm having a hard time believing why people couldn't see with some defensive liabilities for all of them concerning their size. I'm having a hard time seeing why people can't believe Kyrie can't get on the squad. And as great as he is offensively and with the defensive liabilities to a certain extent, still be the guy on that team. Still be the guy on which team? Cleveland? I'm I'm saying any team he went to. No, Why do you think that people can't see that about Kyrie? I don't get that impression. I think everybody sees that about Kyrie. We know that we know that he's not LeBron. We know that he's not LeBron. But at the same time, we can't sit up there and say that, you know, we don't look at Kyrie that way. Kyrie can ball, man. Yeah, most definitely. It's just some people like Tom Haberstro, you know, he likes to get into the numbers. He was doing some of his hits yesterday and it seemed like the numbers combined with his eye test, he was believing like, I mean, look, Kyrie can't be the guy. He's Three and fourteen with Kevin Love, on um, when LeBron is out. Three and fourteen when it's just him and Kevin Love playing. So I mean, I think if he actually had that chance, well, they, they don't they don't win they don't win when LeBron James is not on the court. But at the same time, that's just a few games. That's not what the season. Made. What we have the ultimate indictment against Kyrie is what he was before LeBron arrived. But that's when he was twenty one years old. He's twenty five now. And so when you look at it from that perspective, he's 25. He's been to three consecutive NBA finals. He's won a championship. He's hit a game winner to deliver the championship. And on top of all of that, he's averaged better than 27 when healthy in the finals against Steph Curry and the crew, Klay Thompson and the crew to be more exact. I got to give credit where credit is due in regards to that and Kyrie. At 6'1 or so, 6'2, uh, you don't want him to be that franchise guy per se. But it clearly, there's nothing about his talent that says he can't pull it off. It's just that LeBron James is a physical freak of nature, just like Kevin Durant is a physical freak of nature. And even though Steph Curry is not a physical freak of nature, the fact that he can pull up from 40 makes him a freak of nature. And that's where it gets interesting. Yeah, you're definitely right about that. Uh, I got one more. I got Hurry one up. Go ahead. Go ahead, bro. Hurry well, up. What, you, what my Panthers are looking like? What you got for them this year? Your pa- Carolina Panthers? Yes, sir. You know what? I expect them to make a return. I don't think they're going to be as bad as they were last year. I'm happy that Gettleman is gone. I hope he can feed his family and he's not going broke. I don't wish that on anybody, but I'm glad he's not the general manager for the Carolina Panthers any longer because I think that he cultivated bad relationships. And because he did that, if that were a player, we'd be saying we got to get them out of that locker room. So if that's the case with a player, how come it can't be the case with the general manager? It was right for Gettleman to be gone. He should have never let go of Josh Norman without having a backup plan. Uh, But having said all of that, I think Ron Rivera, who I just saw about a week ago in the Carolina Panthers, are going to recognize the error of their ways, and I think they'll be okay. And as a result, defensively, they will be a lot better, particularly in the secondary than they were. Offensively, Christian McCaffrey, I'm a fan. I got to admit to you, Brandon, I think it's reverse discrimination. I think if Christian McCaffrey was black, we would be talking about what an elite running back the Carolina Panthers picked up with the number eight overall pick in the NFL draft. But because he is white and playing the running back position, I don't think he's gotten nearly the love that he deserves. I've said that for months, and I'm going to repeat that till the cows come home. This brother and what he did at Stanford, we should be giving him a hell of a lot more praise out of, based off of what he did in college than we have given him. There's no doubt. Appreciate the call. Mike, you're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, Mike? How you doing, man? I'm good. Talk to me, baby. How you doing? What's hey, up? Hey, man, I'm, I'm doing great, man. I'm just loving this LeBron and Kyrie thing. And, man, I admire <laughs> you for one thing, man. Hey, you stick to your guns when you come out with a story or you report what you heard. And, you know what I'm saying, you use the right words. And, once again, you ain't getting nothing wrong. You just reporting what you, what you, what you hear. Well, you the thing about it, right. Mike, it's, it's interesting that you say that because my whole point is this. I could see if I sat up there and I said definitively for a fact this is what happened and I wasn't there. 
What I said was, this is what was told to me. This is what they called and said. This is what the other side called and said. Last night, I'm on the phone, literally, with peeps from the Mitchell Projects in the Bronx that grew up with Kyrie's father, that still know him and the Irvin family, who were talking about what the hell is going on and why this guy feels the way that he feels. Once I do that, I've done my job. What's the problem? Exactly. You know what the problem is? Like you said, LeBron ain't never trying to stand up. He ain't never trying to own nothing that he get that he get caught for. He's been doing that for years. And it's just all coming out. Kyrie the first guy to stand up. You know what I'm saying? To him and say what he had to say. You'll never you know, you don't never hear that about too many other schools. Well it's you know? interesting that you but, say that too, because he is getting hit now and he wanted to change that negative narrative. And LeBron may deserve for that to happen because in reality, at the end of the day, LeBron is not actually wrong in any of this. There's nothing right. definitive that he's done to Kyrie Irving, which is why I don't understand why he had to get caught up in his feelings and be all ultra sensitive about stuff. He's home on vacation. You lost the finals, but you didn't do anything wrong to Kyrie. Kyrie just believes in himself more than most people do. And he's like, I'm a franchise player too, and I'm tired of playing second fiddle to King James. I don't see where either side is wrong. I really don't. Right. Neither side ain't wrong. And I don't understand why people on Kyrie here. Hey, man, the man, the man say he want to move on. Let him move on, man. The man deserve that. He, he, he's that good, man. He's, he has shown what he can do. And like you say, he's been the three finals in a row. Man, ain't nothing else for the man to do. He got all the confidence in the world now. He's going to hit every big shot now, he, now, he come, now, his, come his way. Now, check this you know out. I mean? now, now, check this out. The New York Post. Stephen A. Smith goes scorch earth on LeBron with threat of a real story. How is it a threat when all I said was I could get into what you what what you why you really left in 2010, but we're not going there. Right. How is that a threat? I mean, I, I got to admit, man. I mean, it, 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 do we have to have a conversation? I, I know, listen, I'm not speaking of bonics, but clearly there's right. a difference between how black folks interpret threats and how white folks deter- interpret threats. Because I don't get this. I don't understand how that was a threat. I really know. I really know. You, you know. You know what it is, man. It, it, it's just it's coming from you. So you know <laughs> when it comes from you. You know, all ears, all ears listening, all eyes looking. We're looking, man. Do your thing, man. No I love you, man. Same you know, here. Love, love is always here, bro. You know that. I'll talk to you later. Appreciate you, Mike. 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. I'll continue talking about Kyrie, LeBron, New York, and L.A. markets, and which one would be better for Kyrie. Plus, I'll get into the Dallas Cowboys, specifically Coach Jason Garrett, and why he has basically validated yet again why the Dallas Cowboys are nothing more than an accident waiting to happen. I'll explain that and then some in a minute. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Back to the phones we go right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. ESPN Radio, 866-729-ESPN is the number to call up. That's 866-729-3776. I saw my man LeVar Ball on the air a little while ago. Um, Look, I got news for y'all, ladies and gentlemen. LeVar Ball got on a lot of our nerves. He had me worried about his son because of the pressure he was applying to his son. And you turn around and look at his son. His son's box office. LeVar Ball has Lonzo Ball box office. You watch the summer leagues because of LeVar Ball. You can't wait for the Lakers season to start because of LeVar Ball. Say what you want, but he handled his business, y'all. He really, really did. Kevin in Pennsylvania, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. How are you? Hey, uh, what's up, Stephen A.? I'm all right. Go ahead, man. I got a question about Kyrie. I'm listening. Do you think do you think he's better than LeBron? Of course not. That's an idiotic question. You know I'll basketball, I'll... that's insane. Continue. Bye, man. See, you know, I promised my sisters, especially after my mama passed, that I was gonna try to be nicer to my callers. Cause everybody sit up there, oh, Steve, you're a little bit harsh. It's like we got 
time constraints. You know, we got stuff to do. You know, I'm not trying to be rude, but, you know, we got hundreds of callers on the line. It's like, get to it, get to it, get to it. I appreciate the pleasantries and all of that, but I don't need everybody to spread the love or whatever. But you do also have some of the stupidest callers on the planet. They do stuff like this man was on hold just to ask that dumb question. So he could sit up there and say, yeah, well, watch me get Stephen A to go off for me. See, that's stupid and childish. That's idiotic. That's why from the future, I, I, I'm explaining this to y'all. So in the future, when I just hang up on you and I go to the next caller, you know why. Because I don't tolerate idiocy. Brian in Brooklyn, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? Stephen A. Hey, what's up? I'm all right. Go ahead. Very excited to be on your show. Long-time listener. Uh, I wanted to call in because I listened to you talk about Kaepernick yesterday, and I was totally against everything you were saying. Like, uh, first off, I don't think he plays well enough. That's really why he don't have a job. And you say a lot of things about white and black. Man, everybody who watches the NFL, they like beer, yelling. If you go to a game, it doesn't matter what color you stop are. Stop right there. Stop right there. You were talking about six Stop, five, stop, six stop, six. stop, stop, stop. The owner for the New York Giants would emphatically disagree. He is quoted as saying he has never seen the hostility and the venom in letters and email written to his organization over a player to the degree that Colin Kaepernick, the subject of Colin Kaepernick, received. You can say what you want about Americans and their beer drinking cells with the tailgate parties and all that other stuff. What is undeniable is that even drunk, you will find patriots everywhere, meaning individuals who love this country and what the red, white, and blue represents, who took Colin Kaepernick's stance incredibly personally. That is undeniable. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's fair to him. But there is no question that that exists. And for you to call up here, Brian, and act like, oh, people don't care about that. They just care about football. You got your head in the sand. Because there are tens of millions of people who are NFL fans that were damn near violent over it. And that's a fact. Foolish people. Okay, we agree there, but you didn't say yeah. that. You said they don't yeah, exist. Foolish people. Hold on, hold on, no, no, hold on, hold on. What, do you, hold on. what was your first? Hold on, what, what was your first statement? Because now you're saying they're foolish. I don't. I just. I agree with you there. I agree with you, but that's not what that's you said. It. You said they and don't exist. Gone. Hooray! And then you were saying about how the we they should feel like they should sit down and be quiet. Sixty five percent of them are black. This and that. You started to get racially involved. It's like that's crazy, man. It doesn't matter what color any player hold on, is. Hold on, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. You're talking to my listeners. We have to hear you. Listen to my question. Are you saying it's wrong or that it doesn't exist? That's what I'm asking you. In other words, when you're talking, is the Colin Kaepernick a real issue that you feel is foolish and wrong? Or are you saying that, oh, no, there aren't people out there that's hating on him. It's just that he went one for one in ten and he completed less than 60 percent of his passes. And that's why he doesn't have a job. What is your position? It's a combination. And he didn't take a strong he didn't take a strong enough stance for what he believed in because he didn't really have nothing that he that was concrete that he believed in. And I, I mean, so that's the big part of it right there. And then, yeah, he really didn't play that great. But coming off an injury like, like he did, he well, did Brian, play I agree. I, I agree I with mean, you. Hold on, hold on, Brian. Hold on, Brian. But, hold on, Brian. I agree with you that he didn't play well. But even before he really, really articulated and got into his stance, there were people who were in an uproar just by mere virtue of the fact that he refused to stand for the national anthem. He didn't have to utter a word other than that. The the second they knew that he would not stand for the national anthem intentionally, there was venom aimed in his direction. Are you denying that? No, no, it totally was. It totally was. But okay. that's just being silly. I mean, you had to know that was going to happen. But wait a minute. That's, but, I mean, but, that's but, but, but that's not, but that's not racial. Never... 
that's not that's racial. Okay. If you if you have black people standing up, reminding you that that's perfectly within his right, and you have no problem with it, and you have an abundance of white Americans who were diametrically opposed to it, and actually thought that he should be banned from the NFL because of it, that's not divided along racial lines in terms of perspective. Like I said, Steve, he he can hide behind all these. If you if you go to an NFL game and you disrespect something to do with American flag and that and those in those in those seats, you're gonna get beaten and pummeled. And the only reason he can act like that is because he's behind all these guards. It doesn't matter what color he is. And you know oh, I'm no. right. I, I, but that's the my that's my problem with you. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm saying that's off the subject. Nobody's saying that you're wrong about that. But it's off the subject. It doesn't negate the fact that that's what people felt and that's what people were willing to do. You're just, oh, you know, you're you're changing the narrative. No, that was the narrative. That's what happened. Well, that's why he don't have a job. But he he doesn't have a job because he took that stance to begin with, period. Right, and he can't take that stance when he's hiding behind them. If he wants to hide behind who? He can do it on his own. Hiding behind all the guards and the police and the authority and the people that are doing the NFL show for him oh, to have a place. That's a, different, a, place to, that's a different subject for another day. Have a nice day. Brian is basically talking about he's got security. He's an NFL player. If he were in the stands, he'd get beat up. What's your What's the point of bringing that up? So he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it if he was in the stands because he'd get beat down. That's why you won't hold. Back with more to Stephen A. Smith show in a minute. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Ah, it is 18 minutes past hour number two. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a treat. I I mean, I loved my man Dabo Sweeney. He was on first take in the radio show this past Monday doing imitations of me, teasing me and getting on me because I always pick Alabama. But there's a reason that I pick Alabama because I happen to believe the best coach in college football, arguably in history, coaches that team. He is sitting next to me right now. He is the great Nick Saban for Alabama, four time national champion with the Crimson Tide, by the way, five national championships overall. Coach, an honor and a privilege, sir. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Steve? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing great, man. It's always good to see you. First of all, how are you feeling? coming into this year is this year specifically is this year any different for you than any other year or do you find it all being the same well i think it's always more challenging when the season doesn't end like you would like it to Mm -hmm. um you know i use the statement you know don't waste the failure what that means is is can we all use this as an opportunity to learn some of the things that we need to do so we have a chance to maybe finish a little better uh, but there's always a lot of challenges with every team. We have a lot of new players, lost a lot of good players, 10 guys drafted, seven on defense. Mm-hmm. So not a new, lot of new roles for players. Mm-hmm. And roles doesn't mean just new player. It means new leader, mm-hmm. different role that everybody has to come in and do a good job of so that we develop the kind of team chemistry that's going to allow us to be the kind of team we're capable of. What do you find to be the toughest challenge for you as a coach? Uh, psychological dispositions of the players, mm. all right, to get those guys to practice, to prepare, to understand um, having a purpose and practice in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, what they're trying to do, uh, understanding that reps are really important to uh, reaching out, challenge yourself, uh, do it till you can't get it wrong, not just till you get it right, do it mm-hmm. till you can't get it wrong, uh, speed of the game. You know, fast reactions. You know, a lot of players don't understand the importance of developing these kind of habits in terms of helping them be successful. And to me, that's the biggest challenge, consistency and preparation to do those things so you can play well when the, when, when the challenge comes. And I guess what I'm asking is, do you find that to be challenging for you even to this day? I'm looking at your record at Alabama, 119 and 19 in your career at Alabama. You're entering your 11th season. You've, you've lost 19 games for crying out loud. You've won 86% of your games. Your overall record, Coach, is 210 and 61 overall from Toledo to Michigan State to LSU to Alabama. You're trying to tell me that even now, knowing that, that's still something that's tough for you to pull off for these players? Well, I think it's the biggest challenge. Okay. Uh, is, uh, you know, you got young people, you're trying to get them to invest in themselves. 
Mm -hmm. to be the best version of themselves as a person, as a student, as a football player. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that's a challenge. It's the same challenge as being a parent. Mm -hmm. No different. Mm -hmm. Um, So just trying to get these guys to invest in themselves so that no one ever has a reason to say but. You know, I always tell them the and and the but and the draft. I used to listen in the draft room right. for eight years. You know, I, those two words were the most compelling words for me. Right. Because when they said and, it was all good stuff after that. <laughs> but when they read the player and they said but, it was all bad stuff. And I forgot all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. The great Nick Saban right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Let's transition a little bit because – it was something that I noticed, and, you know, I, I pay attention to a lot of things that you say just from a psychological standpoint like you were looking at too, because I'm not going to lie to you. I, I use it as a, as a tool of inspiration for myself uh, because I've been an admirer of yours for a very, very long time. I watched you last year at times. You seemed, you know, uh, some people look at you and they say irritated, perturbed, or just fiery or whatever. But when you lost the national championship game to, Cle- to Clemson, you seemed uh, like obviously you resigned because – the, the loss was the loss. It's already, the, but you didn't seem, I'm not going to say you weren't bothered because we know better than that, but you seemed like we did the best we could. We just came up short. What were your emotions like in the aftermath of losing that national championship game, particularly considering the expectations? Yeah, well, it's one of the toughest losses, you know, ever for, for me. Um, but the thing that I think is important for me in a situation like that is not to put myself first, but to put the players first. Mm -hmm. And the message I wanted to get to the players was is don't let this one game define who you are. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I I said was, you know, don't waste the failure. Uh, We obviously came up short in this game today, but uh, we didn't finish the game. You know, we really played well for three quarters in the game. Mm -hmm. Uh, We played 80 plays of defense. They had 14 points. They scored the last three times they had the ball. We didn't keep the ball enough on offense. We got tired on defense. They're a really good team. They made some great plays down the road, and we didn't make. We only need to make one play. Make one play anywhere along the line, the game's different. Mm-hmm. All right, so um, you know, there's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be learned. But I, I really felt last year, and this is my fault, that between the SEC championship game and when we played the playoffs, you know, ownership and accountability have always been two words that all of our really good teams that, that they they had that everybody had that they were there. All right, and we had it all last year, and then that long time between those games, right. it seemed like we lost that edge a little bit. Why for do some you think reason. you lost it? Why do you? Do you I, I don't know. Maybe right. distractions. Maybe lots of guys. Right. NFL draft. I, I I don't really know for sure. I know it's my responsibility and my fault to make sure we don't lose it. Uh, but I I just felt that way. I felt it was a little different when we came back to practice and. Um, you know, that's something that we can work on in the future. The great Nick Saban right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. So what are your expectations for this year? Are they the same as always? Do you have any specific expectations? Or do you just look at your roster and say we're talented enough to do what exactly? Well, you know, Stephen A., I look at it a little different as a coach. I'm such a process-oriented guy. You know, I'm thinking what do we have to do to try to get these guys to be the best team that they can be. All right? And I don't really have an expectation. You know, pe- people to me – confuse expectations and outcomes you know like we should win 12 games Mm -hmm. that's an outcome i ask a receiver on our team what's your goal he says i want to catch 50 pass that's not a goal that's an outcome i I want what's your goal as a player you know what kind of player do you want to be all right so what kind of team can we be what kind of identity can we create um how good can we get some of these young players and how quickly can we do it uh those are the challenges to me not not are you going to win the first game? Not are you going to win 12 games? Not, not, not are you going to be in the playoffs again? I mean, these things will be outcomes that we, if we can do a good job, maybe we can create right, by getting the players on our team to be all they can be as people, students, and as football players, and to get them to improve. Mm. I mean, that's the key to the drill. How do you develop your team? Let's get specifically into some of these players. Um, Jalen Hurts is a special talent. I like him a lot. But Deshaun Watson clearly appeared to be on another level. I mean, we understand that. How is he developing? How is he coming along? How important is his development to you and your success this year? Right. Well, I I think that, you know, Deshaun Watson, you have to look at Deshaun Watson when he was a sophomore, when he played, and the mistakes that he made. Mm -hmm. And and to make a true comparison, because you're talking about a lot of experience. The guy was a three-year starter and and played like one. And I think was – 
the player that challenged us the most that we played all year long was Deshaun Watson. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Mm-hmm. But Jalen has had a great off season. Uh, I think last year we 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 didn't develop Jalen in the passing game like we needed to to be able to make plays in the passing game in a big game. That's our fault, not his. We were a little risk aversive. Mm-hmm. He had a great year, made a lot of plays for us. But just as a pure passer, that was the goal in the off season to improve efficiency, and he's done a really good job of that. So, uh, and and I don't think it's going to help his production. It's going to help other players on our team's production who can make a lot of big plays. Because I think when you get in big games, you know you got to make plays in the passing game. You got to be able to run the ball, but you got to be able to have that balance. I and that's the most important thing that I think at times last year we struggled to create the balance that we need in the passing game. Now, Coach, when you say you were risk-averse, was that because of him or was it because of you? Well, I think it was because of him and me. Okay. All right? I didn't want to ask him to do things he wasn't ready to do. Mm-hmm. All right? I didn't want to, we, didn't, we didn't want to put too much on the guy. Mm-hmm. All right? so, uh, and he did a great job for us all year long. I mean, you know, we won 14 games. Right. I, and we got in the national championship game. Mm-hmm. I, but when Clemson played us, they almost forced us and challenged us to pass the ball. And we couldn't do it effectively enough. Mm-hmm. I, and that really wasn't his fault. That was our fault because we should have been doing some of those things all year long in expectation mm-hmm. that we were going to come up to that. Gotcha. I, so that's what I mean by that. A couple of quick questions before I let you get on out of here. Some of the, some, some, Somewhat generic uh, this defense, how good is it going to be this year, and why? We lost seven guys to the NFL. Yeah. We got a lot of holes to fill, a lot of challenges, a lot of good young players that don't have a whole lot of experience. So it'll be interesting to see how the chemistry, the identity, the leadership all develop on that side of the ball. I think the physical talent will be there, I. but that's what I don't see in this defensive team so far is a group of guys that really want to create the kind of identity that I'd like to see a defense have. I mean, to be a good defensive team, you got to start with hateful, man. You got to be hateful. I mean, it's just, say it, Coach Saban. Say it. It's, it's the, the truth. It is. <laughs> I mean, you can't be a nice that's, guy. That's you want right. everybody like you that's when right. you play defense? Right, uh, right. You got to be hateful. Let, you know, this story, this this storyline's been going out there for days now. SEC, ACC saying that they're the best conference in football. It's no longer the SEC. You know what? I'm willing to say that. Let me tell you why I'm willing to say that, Coach. It's all your fault because you ruined it because you've been so dominant in the SEC. No one in the SEC seems to matter but Alabama the most of the country. How do you feel about what they're saying about these other conferences in comparison to the SEC in all seriousness? Well, in all seriousness, it doesn't matter to me. I'm worried about our team. I'm worried about developing our team. I think there's a lot of good conferences. I think there's a lot of good teams in each and every one of these conferences. Mm-hmm. Some some people have a couple good teams in their conference. Some people are good from top to bottom. How do you really evaluate a conference? Yeah. And what good does it do me to do that? I mean, I'm worried about our team. How good can we be? How do we develop our team? And the challenges that our league presents, which are tremendous. The SEC has had attendance, great attendance. Uh, great All-Americans, lots of players drafted, lots of championships that we won in the last 10 years. So, I mean, that's for somebody else to make that comparison Mm -hmm. Uh, because I don't watch all these teams unless we play them. Um, But I know that the competition in our league is really, really good, Mm -hmm. and we'll have plenty of challenges in our league from our season this year, but our focus is on our team, and it really doesn't matter to me what anybody cares about who has the best league? My very last question. What well, you're one of my favorite coaches of all time. Unapologetically, everybody get over it. I don't give a damn what y'all say. This man is the man. Who's your favorite coach of all time? My favorite coach of all time. Well, for the Alabama folks, I always had a tremendous amount of respect for Coach Bryant. Yeah, what he course. what he was able to do over a long, long period of time. Mm-hmm. But in modern day, the guy that had the most impact and effect on me as a coach was the four years I spent with Bill Belichick. Mm. I, I learned the most, uh, greatest impact, greatest organization, uh, saw the game from a different perspective, uh, and that's helped me get to the next level as a coach. I'm going to say this before I let you go. I, don't only, I, I, I consider you a great coach, obviously, but I think I'm such a fan because I think you're so important for these kids in today's generation to have a coach like you 
your attitude, your approach to it, your discipline, what you demand from them, and more importantly, how you prepare them for the real world. That's why I'm one of your biggest fans. All the best to you, Nick Saban. I'd really appreciate you being on the show, and thank you for being here. Today. All right. Thanks, Stephen A. Right. appreciate you saying that. No problem. Thank you. The one and only Nick Saban right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, 866-729-ESPN. That's 866-729-3776. More of your calls in a minute. This is Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. What an honor and a privilege it is to talk to one of my favorite coaches in all of sports. That would be Roll Tide, baby, Nick Saban. I just love that the man is no nonsense. There's a commitment to winning that you have to put forth on every single day. And if you're going to go and, and play, for Nick Saban, you got to be ready to work. No mercy. That's what kids in today's generation needs. That's why I'm such a huge fan. I know that Alabama somehow, some way going to be ready. I know that they ain't going to lose because they lazy. They were unprepared work-wise. I promise you that. I promise you that. I respect the hell out of that man. I really, really do. I know he's not perfect. But he's pretty damn close to perfect as far as I'm concerned as a head coach in any professional sport. I'm telling you that right now. Let me transition to some NFL action because Jason Garrett and the Dallas Cowboys made news yesterday. Remember that kid, Lucky Whiteside? What is it? Lucky Whitehead? Wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys? um, Was accused of, of, uh, basically was told, you know, was accused of being arrested because uh, of shoplifting. Turns out that it was a case of mistaken identity, ladies and gentlemen. Mistaken identity. But guess what? The Cowboys had cut him before that. Cut him. And then even though they cut him, once it was learned that it was a case of mistaken identity, you would think that the Dallas Cowboys would at least have the decency to say, we regret our decision, we were wrong, we weren't right, it was our mistake. You would think they would have the decency to at least do that. But no. Listen to Jason Garrett. Yesterday we made a decision that we deemed to be in the best interest of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, we're standing by that decision. We're going to move on. But that decision was based on the idea that he'd been arrested last week, correct? Uh, yesterday we made a decision that we thought was in the best interest of the Dallas Cowboys. And we're going to stand by that decision. We're going to move on. Not fair to him to just keep saying that over and over? It's the truth. We made a decision that we thought was in the best interest of the yeah. Dallas Cowboys. Why are some of the other players, Jason, dealing with off the field issues and still on the Cowboys? Guys, this will be the last time I'll say it. I appreciate your interest in it. Uh, we made a decision yesterday in regards to Lucky Whitehead that we think is in the best interest of the Dallas Cowboys. We're standing by that decision. And we're going to move forward. If you have any other football questions, I'm happy to answer them. In regards to this particular issue, Jason Garrett and the Dallas Cowboys are an utter disgrace. An absolute utter disgrace. You can't even own the fact that you may have been wrong in prejudging this guy. You can't even have the decency to say, look, ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry that we reacted off of the news of him purportedly shoplifting. But guess what? We were going to cut him anyway. You can't even give an explanation. You just throw this kid under the bus. The police department, for crying out loud, issued a damn apology because they were wrong. But the Cowboys can't do it? I mean, what the hell is that? I mean, the Dallas Cowboys are just, uh, and as it pertains to this, I'm not joking. I'm joking around when I'm getting on the Cowboys fans because I love getting on Cowboy fans and I love them getting back at me. But it's all love because I don't hate Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott and, and Des Bryant. Des Bryant's my man. 
I got nothing but love for them. I'm just having fun because I'm a native New Yorker, and I love hating on the stars because the Dallas Cowboy fans are the most nauseating, delusional, obnoxious, disgusting fan base in sports American history as far as I'm concerned. But that's all in fun. This is serious. This is the height of arrogance. As far as I'm concerned, you listening to, to Jason Garrett yesterday, he's no different than a president. And I'm not casting any aspersions or casting any judgment on the president's politics. I'm just alluding to the fact that he never admits he's wrong. I mean, did you see Alec Baldwin on Saturday Night Live, you know, months ago when he said, uh, I would like to apologize. And the woman said, what, what? He said, I sincerely apologize. And she said, do you mean apologize? Oh, no, I would never do that. That was Alec Baldwin imitating Donald Trump. That was Jason Garrett yesterday. You can't even take a second as a human being with some modicum of decency in your soul. Jump into conclusions like the rest of us did, by the way, in believing the police when they said that Lucky Whitehead had been arrested for shoplifting. Come to find out it was a, stake of a, a case of mistaken identity because the person that was arrested gave the Lucky Whitehead's name and date of birth. So we understand how the error happened, but it didn't stop the police from apologizing. It didn't stop media pundits from apologizing, which includes me, by the way. I apologize to the guy. But the Dallas Cowboys who cut him, took away his paycheck and his living, his livelihood, and he's out there looking for a job right now, you can't find it within yourself to apologize? Jason Garrett is a disgrace for that. And so are Stephen Jones and Jerry Jones for putting him out there to sound like a damn idiot. Let me take that back. Not an idiot. An insensitive human being. That's much worse than being stupid. I mean, if you're, if, if, if you're idiotic, you're idiotic. But it, when you're insensitive, that means you're that way on purpose and you don't seem to give two cents about it. How could you do that? You cut this man after he was purportedly arrested. Where's NFL security? Where's security for team personnel? How come y'all didn't do y'all damn homework? And find out about the case of the mistaken identity before the rest of us did. Jason Garrett should be ashamed of himself. Stephen Jones and Jerry Jones should be ashamed of themselves for putting them out there. Pox on all their damn houses for that. You can't come out and just say you sorry. It was a very unfortunate situation. We stand by our decision because that's not the only reason we cut him, but we're real sorry that we were one of the people who jumped to the conclusion. What's the matter? You worried about getting sued? Defamation of character, maybe? Is that what you're scared about? Because you should be. The fact that Jason Garrett and the Dallas Cowboys couldn't even apologize? If I had a suit that I could pursue, if I were Lucky Whitehead, I'd do it. Especially if he's unable to find a job. Maybe then he'd get an apology. Since they can't exude or exert some level of human decency in order to do it of their own volition. Your call is to close out the show in a minute with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Mm, all right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors mm-hmm. <laughs> and shapes. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. 
phones we go real quick before we get on out of here. Let's go to Reese in Cali. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, Reese. How you doing, Stephen A.? It's good to hear from you. Thanks uh, a lot. Real quick, quick point. Uh, Carmel, this is excluding uh, Kyrie from the, from the equation. Carmelo, Derrick Rose, LeBron James. Now, is that better than Carmelo, Paul George, and Russ Westbrook? All three of them have been played by themselves, so they're happy to have some help. They The shooting and the defense, the rebounding, and they won't be that selfish with the ball. What do you think? Good point. Good point. I'm just not sure all of them want to be in Oklahoma City, but I hear you. Thanks a lot for the call. Dre and West Palm, real quick. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Big homie, what's good, man? I'm good, bro. Go ahead. First off, I want to tell you, if you get a chance, Stephen A., check my podcast out, PSA Podcast. All right. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. What is it? What, what is it? What, what, what's, what's your podcast? It's called PSA Podcast. We actually did a um, PSA, PSA appreciation. P- PSA Paul Stephen Anthony? No, PSA Podcast. Okay. Right? But we did a Stephen A. Appreciation, so when you get a chance, I want you to check that out. I definitely will. Um, definitely will. Go real ahead. Real quick, real quick, man. LeBron James, man, you're a great player, but you just got phone in your DNA. Number two, Carmelo Anthony. Stephen A., please, I want him to get out of New York, man. His legacy has been whack in New York. I know that's your man. But it has been. No, 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 no. You've been right, Dre. It, was, it is whack in New York. His legacy in New York I is whack. I want him to go to Cleveland, man. I want him to go to Cleveland. Give us Kyrie. Melo, the only thing you did great in New York was score 62 points on a Wednesday night. That nobody cared about Stephen A. You're it's right. been a waste of time him being in New York. Yeah, he need, he Would needs you agree to get, with that? He want, but in fairness to him, yes, I do. In fairness to him, he told James Dolan he wants out. He doesn't want to be back. They're trying to trade him. It's just that they're not going to give him away for chopped liver. Ryan Anderson out of Houston ain't going to be enough. They would prefer to have Kyrie Dre, and they're trying. I want Kyrie and KP. Melo, if you want to bounce okay. on a good note, your legacy in New York will be bouncing to okay, Cleveland. Dre, I got to go. I appreciate it. I agree with you wholeheartedly. You're absolutely right. Got to get on out of here. I'm going to holler at y'all 22 hours from now. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show signing off until tomorrow, everybody. We'll get more into some NBA stuff, more into some NFL stuff. There's always something happening. Just stick around. 22 hours from now, the Stephen A. Smith Show shall return. Peace and love. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Channel 80 and the ESPN app.